Yes, they can hear me. All right. Uh, well, as I said, Happy New Year. Uh, today we're going to dedicate the show to a review of uh, 2016 and uh, talk a little bit about 2017. I am actually in San Jose, so I'm not at home. Uh, we are broadcasting live on Facebook Live, so um, you can check out the, um, the video over there. And I've got a lot, uh, a lot of stuff to cover. Reviewing 2016. So, what what is characteristic of uh, of this last year? What what would you say is um, the most important of events of last year? And of course, I think everybody's going to jump on and say the election of Donald Trump. And uh, and yeah, absolutely, probably the most important, significant event of the year. And I'm going to try. It's going to be hard, but I'm going to try now to talk too much about Donald Trump because I've done so much of that so far. And I, you know, I'm going to disappoint a lot of you, but I haven't changed my mind about him. Uh, I'm still pretty negative about, or not pretty negative, very negative about Donald Trump. So. Um, he's done nothing in the last uh, month. His appointments have been not bad, but he's done nothing in the last month to uh, to make me feel or think any better of him. But I think what's more significant is what the election of Donald Trump represents. And more than that, if we look at all the events globally, if we look at everything that's going on in the world, is there some unifying theme? Is there something that brings it all together, that explains it all? Um, and, uh, and I would argue, yes, I think, I think there was a, a definitely a, a universal theme to 2016. There's definitely a, uh, you know, a general, uh, a general movement. Uh, it's, it's, not, it's not good. It's a, negative, uh, it's a negative movement. But there's definitely, there's definitely something that unites, I'd say, most of the events of 2016. I, I made a list just kind of everything that came into my mind of important things that I think happened uh, during the year. And then I try to categorize them, and they all kind of fit into this big theme. So, so here's the theme, and then we're going to try to break it down uh, into, uh, into what it actually means. And by the way, if you want in on the conversation and uh, you, you want to chat about any of this, 347-324-3075, 347-324-3075. Three zero seven five, and particularly if you've never called the show before, call in. Uh, but the regulars can call in as well. Uh, and uh, if you have some uh, events, important events of twenty sixteen that I do not mention, uh, jump in uh, and and uh, offer what you got. Or if you disagree with my theme, or if you disagree with the with the what you think the what you think is happening in the world, let me know. All right. Now, I'm using, I'm, I'm going to be a little slow today because I'm using uh, uh, my laptop because I'm on the road, so I don't have my big, two, massive 27-inch screens in front of me where I've got all the news stories laid out and my outline for the show laid out, so it's a little slow. Uh-oh. All right, so I, I, I've got one more technical thing to deal with here. Let's see if I've got the right wire. I've got the right cable. All right. Um, let me deal with this. And let me get back to you one second. I think, I think this will do. All right. I think we're good. Maybe. We'll see. Uh, all right. So theme. What are we? Uh, what are we talking about? Well, I think what characterizes this year is really a, a continuation of the decline of the West, a continuation of the impotence of Western, of, of, of the elites, the intellectual, the political, the economic elites in the West. But what's different about 2016, what I think will, will characterize the year 2016 and differentiate it, uh, from uh, previous years is the fact that the people have woken up to this. So people have recognized, and this is the positive, if you will, the positive spin on the election of Donald Trump and Brexit and the vote in Italy and many of the other votes in the world, is that people are pissed off. 
They've recognized that the world around them is bankrupt. It's culturally bankrupt. It's philosophically bankrupt. It's economically bankrupt. It's culturally bankrupt. And they have woken up. They are starting. I don't think it's the end of it. I think we're going to see a lot more. They have started to respond. Uh, They have started to react. Now, the reaction and the response have been primarily, and we've talked about this all year, they've been tribal, they've been emotionalistic, they've been nationalistic, they've been a very negative response. But it is a response. It is a response to real evil. So, It is a response to the true nature or the true state of the culture in which we live. It is a response to the real state of the West. It is a response to real threats, for example, the Islamist threat that the West faces. It is a response to leftist philosophical, intellectual, cultural bankruptcy and corruptness and and the political class feeling they can get away with everything. And I think that's what Hillary represented for many people. It's the idea that you can get away with anything. You can be unbelievably corrupt. You can be unbelievably anti-American. And nobody seems to care. Well, American people says, well, now we do care. Now, again, the, 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 the now we do care, what is the alternative? Well, what is the alternative? The alternative is what exactly you'd expect, given that philosophy leads a culture that philosophy determines the state of the world, that philosophy is what ultimately guides the choices that people make. So if the philosophy is bad, then when people wake up to the corrupt state of the country, they are going to choose something, an alternative, that's still corrupt. Because philosophically, the fact is that philosophically... Nothing has changed. Philosophically, there is no new alternative in the West to the, uh, the standard conservative and, and, uh, and uh, you know, progressive, uh, nihilistic agenda. Conservatives and the left, and I hate, the, I hate using the term left. I'm, I need a new term, and I don't want to call them liberals. Because that's too nice of a word. I actually like the word liberal. Liberal, liberal used to represent liberty and freedom and uh, pro-capitalism, pro-individual rights. So I hate to call the bastards on the left liberals. So, uh, you know, you've got to get me a, I need a new term, right? Because they're all collectivists. So, so you've got collectivists of the left and collectivists of the right. And people are rebelling against both. But they're rebelling with a different form of collectivism. Call it collective, you know, collectivism 2.0 or collectivism negative 2.0 or whatever. But it's not that they've discovered individualism. It's not that they've discovered capitalism. It's not that they've discovered reality and reason. So, um, okay, my, my, my two friends on their iPhones have reminded me because they're sitting there doing something on their iPhones, which is fine. Uh, but it reminded me, which is great. Uh, that you guys should live tweet the show, right? So um, anybody's listening live, if you're on Twitter, go live tweet the show because um, that's how we'll grow the audience, right? If each one of you live tweets to your people, that'll be viewed by hundreds, maybe thousands, maybe tens of thousands, and that's how the show will grow. You can also do the equivalent of live tweeting on Facebook. I don't know how that works. Although, uh, you know, link to the uh, Facebook live feed, right? The show is live on Facebook, which is uh, cool. And plus, if somebody on the comments on Facebook can put in the URL for the blog talk, that'll be great. All right, we're doing a lot of technical stuff. Anyway, so this is the key to understanding 2016. Nothing philosophically has changed, but people are fed up with the status quo. So they are going to adopt the existing corrupt bad philosophy of altruism, collectivism, and anti-reason to something new because they're pissed off at the status quo. That doesn't mean they're going to embrace reason, individualism, and egoism. No, there's no reason for them to do that. There's nobody 
other than a few voices here and there, advocating for those ideas. There's no, there's no awareness of these ideas. Indeed, everywhere we go, there's a, a, an explicit rejection of the ideas, both of, on the part of intellectuals, uh, conservative intellectuals and um, progressive intellectuals. So there is no embrace. There is no embrace of individualism. There is no embrace of reason. And there is no embrace of capitalism anywhere on the political spectrum. So where are people going to go if they want to reject the status quo? Well, they're going to go, you know, I think in this case, it seems like people are moving towards uh, the anti, but not the anti-collectivism, not the anti-altruism, not the anti-emotionalism, but the anti-status quo that still embraces altruism, collectivism, and emotionalism. Now remember, nothing's changed in academia. In academia, this year was just another year of, of nuttiness, uh, expressed, I think, particularly in the battle around free speech. Free speech this year has come under massive attack on American campuses. This is the year, if you're going to remember the year on campuses with anything, it's the year of the snowflake, right? It's the year of the, what are they, still millennials? These are the younger millennials. This is the year where the millennials got their feelings hurt by speakers on campus, by ideas they didn't like, by people saying things they didn't like. And this is the first year, and maybe it's probably started in 2015 or 14. This is the first year where the universities basically capitulated to that, creating safe spaces where they could go and hug a teddy bear or listen to soft, calming music. You know, they, they, they should have put like a, a guru in there so they could meditate with them and really calm themselves and unite with something. I don't know what, what, what you unite with when you, when you listen to those gurus. Anyway, um, this is the year where it seemed like young people were obsessed with their own emotions, with their own feelings, with not being upset, with elevating their feeling to the status of truth and uh, elevating being upset, being emotionally upset to the level of coercion, of physical force being implemented against them so that they could use being offended as a means to silence other people, right? So the whole microaggression, the whole idea of microaggression on university campuses, the whole idea of microaggression is to use the word aggression that is, to blur the distinction between speech and action, to blur the distinction between offending somebody and punching them in the face, right? So, because if you punch somebody in the face, the state can come in and stop them. The state can intervene. The state can block them. Free speech protects us if we offend somebody. But if offending somebody now is the same as punching them in the face, then there goes free speech. Now the state can intervene. The state is there to protect us against violence, against coercion, against force. And the whole point, again, of the idea, of the term, of the concept of microaggression is to blur the distinction between force and speech, force and emotional offense. All right, so on campuses, I would say that the number one issue uh, became the attack on free speech uh, again more as a as a uh, attempt to cause people to self censor than as using the government to silence people. So we still have the First Amendment in this country. This is the difference, by the way, between the U.S. One of the key differences between the U.S. and Europe today is that the fact that we have in our constitution a protection for free speech, and that in Europe they don't have that, so they can pass hate speech laws. Whereas in the United States, we can't pass hate speech laws, but our public institutions, like our universities, can certainly pass hate speech codes, which try to silence people. So it's not quite the same silencing effect as if the government actually imposed these laws, but it is a step in that direction. And I would argue, and I think this is true, that if we did not have the First Amendment, if we did not have an explicit Bill of Rights that protected free speech, free speech would be on massive decline in the United States, and, and we would be much like Europe in the sense of adopting hate speech laws um, 
in this country. So, you know, again, we're lucky in this country because we have the founding fathers and we're lucky in a sense that Madison lost the debate, lost the debate um, about the Bill of Rights, U ultimately came around to believing the Bill of Rights was a good idea, but originally was against the Bill of Rights because I think if, if, if we had not have a Bill of Rights, we would be in deep, deep doo-doo. I mean, the fact is the Bill of Rights and, and the Constitution has already been eroded dramatically, uh, almost almost to the point where we can't um, where we can't even identify it, where we can't even find it. But at least on some issues like free speech, we still have it. So 2016 is the year of the attacks on free speech on campuses. It is the year, I mean, again, it, this has started in 1415, but really came to the forefront, really became a public issue uh, during, uh, during this year. I, I, so one other issue that I think, uh, well, so, that was a big one. And another issue that I think serves an important importance only in the sense that um, I think people were rebelling against this uh, was that, again, over 15 and 16, the whole transgender issue became a huge issue. Uh, and put aside what you think about that issue and, and what you think, there, because certainly... There is an issue there of of uh, of, of rights, and, and and people have people have right to do what they will with their body and to define themselves how they want to define themselves. But I think the issue became a huge cultural issue, and it was blown all out of proportion by uh, the media. And uh, you know, this became one of the favorite topics of for the New York Times to write about. And I think this is part of the alienation that much of America felt towards the. Uh, mainstream media, the leftist elites, uh, the, 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 the collectivist elites, the elites that uh, um, tend to be on the left. I'm still struggling with how to get rid of this uh, uh, left-right distinction, how to, how, to, how to replace it with something uh, meaning, more meaningful. Uh, anyway, I guess I'm going to continue to be struggling with that. So while I'm going to use left and right, recognize the fact that I don't view myself anywhere on that spectrum. I, I don't buy this um, we are really on the right, and the right is really not the right. And the, 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 the right and the, you know, there's collectivism versus individualism. Uh, but I think there's an important differentiation between the, what's today considered the left collectivism and right collectivism. So I'm going to stick with that distinction in that context. So I think that alienation partially came from the fact that uh, mainstream media and our intellectual elites was so obsessed by issues that I think most of Americans, particularly at the time of economic fear, of economic stagnation, of economic issues, felt just alienated from. It, it, it's not even that they objected to the particulars, it's just that who cares about bathrooms when I don't have a meaningful job, I don't have a good job, the economy is not doing well, I feel scared, the Muslims are invading, whatever. Uh, instigated the, ha the, the, the fear that people had, they felt detached from what the, 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 mainstream, uh, the mainstream media, if you will, uh, were talking about. So I think that's a big part of it. All right, um, let's see. I need to do something here. One second. All right, I think uh, I, I'm back. Uh, sorry about that. More technical issues. One of these days we'll get all these technical issues worked out and we will have no more problems ever again, right? We'll see. Okay, I had a, a all right, so, um, so that's, I, I'd say that's where we, we, you know, some of the intellectual elites, some of the top stories from the intellectual elites. It was a lot more going on. Obviously there was an election an election in which I think people felt so alienated from the mainstream media, and I think this is a this this has really been um, one of the key stories of, of 2016 is this alienation from the mainstream, alienation from mainstream media, from the mainstream elites, from the from the university professors, from the intellectuals, and unfortunately. So many people have chosen to throw the baby out with the bathwater, so they rejected all media, 
uh, and and shift it to uh, to some of these ridiculous, um, completely uh, uncredible uh, alternative media sources as a consequence. Okay, uh, let's see. I'm going to take I'm going to take a call before I switch. I want to talk uh, a little bit about foreign policy, and and then we'll get to some economic issues in Europe, and there's tons and tons to talk about. Oh, wait, we're going to take a call from uh, Eric Couture, too. Hi, you're on the Yuan Book Show. Who's this? Hey, Skylar, happy new year. How's it going? Good, good. You excited about 2017? Well, I'm with you. I'm I'm looking forward to I'm looking forward to wake, making money in 2017. There you go. That's a, that's a good optimistic spin on things. Yep. Sure. <laughs> no, no. Yeah, you're gonna have to give me a little bit of time on that one. I'll get to it. Promise. Okay. Okay. Yep. Okay, fast status versus faster status. All right, I don't know. That's a mouthful. And and fast, nobody understands what that, you know, nobody's going to understand what that means. And nobody knows what the status is. Nobody knows what the status is. All right, yeah, I've got a question here. Um, yeah, I know. I know. By the way, Facebook Live. I know the call is not mixed in. Next week, all will be good. You will. Everybody. Will, thanks, Scott. I really appreciate the call. Uh, keep thinking of keep thinking of uh, of terminologies. And Facebook Live. I apologize. The, the calls are not going to be uh, mixed in. I do not. I do not travel with a mixer. But I did buy for next week. I bought this cool. 10 channel mixer and I'm going to have an audio guy come in next week and install and everything is going to be connected and it's going to be connected to this show and my AM560 show and any other video I do in the future and we are slowly building the Iran Brook Show studio in, uh, in my uh, old son's bedroom uh, in my house uh, in California. But it's still going to be a challenge when I travel. So the next step is to is to find a small mixer that I can travel with, and then be able to hook everything in through that mixer and make sure I have the right cables. So you're just going to have to be patient with me. You know, uh, uh, Facebook Live is is still at the experimental level, still experimental stage. Uh, but I'm excited about it. I hope you're excited about it, and we will get it right so that everybody will be able to enjoy the show, and then. You know, when Twitter Live comes on board and when Instagram Live comes on board, we'll be connected to everything, right? Because we're going to be cutting edge here in the Iran Brook Show. We're going to be. All right. So, so as I said, the theme for 2016 is continued impotence of the West. Continued impotence of the West on all fronts. Intellectual, foreign policy, domestic, economic, just impotence of our politicians impotence of our intellectuals, impotence of our economic leaders, just, just a complete bankruptcy, ideological bankruptcy. And the people have woken up. That's really 2016. The people have woken up. And we'll see more of that in 2017 as we get elections in France, in the Netherlands, um, as, as Brexit starts being implemented in the UK. You're going to see the people rising up. Is that a good thing? Is that a bad thing? Well, yeah, it's a good thing that they woke up. It's a bad thing that they might be waking up to and creating an even worse nightmare for us all. Uh, but let's talk a little bit about um, about foreign policy, right? Um, because I think if, if you think about the West's impotence, one of the areas in which that impotence is is obvious is uh, is foreign policy. And let me break this up into two. I want to talk about American foreign policy, uh, American impotence abroad, 
And then I want to talk about European impotence because European impotence uh, has to do uh, both domestically and foreign policy. And then we'll go back to the United States and talk about economics, cultural uh, decline, and and then um, and then I, so all of this kind of comes together with this impotence theme, which is you know I think pretty obvious. Uh, but then we'll talk about the waking up, and then of course I do want to talk about. I'm being criticized, right? So a lot of objectivists out there, and I know not all of you objectivists, but a lot of objectivists out there have said, you're on, you don't know what you're talking about. Uh, Donald Trump, Donald Trump represents the American sense of life. Donald Trump is the American sense of life waking up. This is good stuff. This is the American sense of life saying enough is enough. And this is a true statement of what Ayn Rand called the American sense of life. And this is a great thing that happened with this election. I'm not convinced, guys. You know, so I want to talk about the state of the American sense of life. And I want to talk about the rejection of the status quo, the rejection of the culture that we have, the bad culture that we have, and whether every rejection like that represents a positive in a sense of the waking up of what Ayn Rand called the American sense of life. And I want to remind you what Ayn Rand thought the American sense of life was and what is represented. And let's then see whether the election of Donald Trump and everything else going on in the world in terms of this rebellion really represents what Ayn Rand meant by, by the American sense of life. I don't think so. I mean, what I think has woken up much more than the American sense of life, but what I think has woken up in America is the European sense of life, and that's scary. All right, but we'll get to that. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm jumping ahead just to give you a teaser so you stick around and you don't, you don't leave right now. Well, you, you know, I, I, I got I to gotta keep, uh, keep dangling some goodies out there so that you stick with me uh, through the next, uh, the next half hour or the next hour. All right, uh, so let's, let's quickly review American impotence abroad, right? And, and this is really, I think, 16 years, 16 years of pathetic, weak, ridiculous, stupid foreign policy from America. And I, I, you know, I know all of you, all of you love to blame every problem in the world on Obama. And I'm cool with that because I hate Obama almost as much as you guys do. I probably hate him a little bit less than you guys do. But I can guarantee you this. I hate George W. Bush 10 times more than any of you. I know that because I know you guys. And you guys are soft on Bush, and you have been forever. And I'll tell all of you guys who are critical of me criticizing Trump, you guys were all critical of me when I criticized Bush. I voted. Now, I did not vote for Hillary Clinton this election. I know some of you are spreading the rumor I see it on Facebook that I voted for Hillary Clinton. So for the record, I did not. I didn't vote for Donald Trump, but I didn't vote for Hillary Clinton. I didn't even vote for Johnson. I did not vote. I did not believe that not a single one of those candidates deserved my vote uh, or deserved to be anywhere near the presidency of the United States. I did not vote. But in 2004, some of you do not know this. Some of you do. But in 2004, I voted for John Kerry. The same John Kerry who just gave that evil speech about Israel like yesterday or the day before yesterday. I voted in 2004 for John Kerry, and I'm proud of that vote. And I wish John Kerry had won in 2004 because he would have been blamed for the financial crisis. He would have been blamed for Iraq. We would have never got Barack Obama. Uh, the whole history of the United States would have shifted and bought us more time. George W. Bush was a disaster. I hated him from 9-12-2001. I was critical of him from 9-12-2001. And you know what? I was right and you guys were wrong. Well, not all of you guys because some of you agreed with me. But some of you guys were wrong. And the same thing is going to happen with Trump. I'm going to be right and you guys are going to be wrong. Now, the fact is I actually hope I'm wrong and you're right. I hope Donald Trump turns out to be great. The pro-individualism, pro-capitalism, pro-reason candidate that you guys are fantasizing about. That's what I hope he is. But I'm pretty confident. I'm pretty confident that ain't happening. Um, but 
you know, George Bush was a disaster. He, he, you know, the war in Iraq was a disaster. 5,000 young Americans lost their lives for nothing. For, for, for stupid rules of engagement that George Bush put in place. The ridiculous uh, nature of uh, Operation Iraqi Freedom. The whole sacrificial, altruistic, Christian way in which those wars were being fought. Ah, okay, I, I don't want to get into a whole, uh, whole George Bush thing, but, but, right, Obama then took it to the next level. If George Bush required UN approval and thumbs up for everything that he did, if George Bush sacrificed American troops on the ground to uh, Iraqis, and two Afghans, and two our worst enemies. Sacrifice the lives of your kids to our worst enemies. Then Obama wanted to sacrifice all America to our worst enemies. He wanted us to so-called lead from behind. He wanted to make America just like every other country on the planet. He wanted to emphasize American weakness, emphasize American humility, emphasize that America is no better and no different than the rest of the world. Let me be very clear. Obama is the first and only so far, because I don't consider uh, uh, Trump in this category, the first and only anti-American president we've ever had. Right? He did not like this country, does not like this country. He wanted America to be Europe. He wanted America to be the anti-American. He hated this country, and it came across... In, 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 in his early on, particularly in his speech in Cairo, um, in uh, Michelle Obama's statement about never being proud of America except on the day they elected Obama, uh, and, and the rest of it. So uh, here's a president who has been anti-American from the beginning, weak. You remember the red line he drew in Syria? Now, I don't think he should have drawn the red line. It was a stupid red line. But if you draw a red line and you're president of the United States, you better live up to it. He just backed off from it. And he let, at every point during the Syrian conflict, he has let the Russians take control. He has let the Russians lead. He, you remember when he called ISIS an insignificant nothing, didn't matter, was not worth bothering with? Well, look what happened. Right? We'll get to ISIS when I talk about 2017, but we'll get to ISIS. But here he was, a president who got everything wrong on foreign policy. You remember his pivot to Asia, and what was the result of the pivot to Asia? Was being disrespected by the Chinese. Now the Chinese are more authoritarian than they've ever been before. This is one of the, one of the things that happened in 2016. And I think a direct consequence, direct consequence of our impotence, of, of the West's impotence, and China looking at the West and saying, we do not want to be like those guys. We do not want to have anything like those guys' culture, those guys' politics, those guys' Uh, world. And as a consequence, China has become more authoritarian. They have lost their respect for the West, and as a consequence, they have lost the West, particularly America, as a role model for what they would, would and should become, which I think they had once. Yeah, so now on Facebook Live, you can see me sipping the coffee. The rest of you just have to, why is he pausing? What's he doing? Well, now you can actually see it. All right. So all over the world, what the rest of the world has learned, particularly those who are not our allies, let's put it that way, so not part of the Western alliance, which I would consider Europe, uh, North America, and uh, parts of Asia, Japan, South Korea, Taiwan, places like that. What they basically... What the rest of, of the world has learned is that the West is impotent. The West is not going to stand up. They, you know, we cut a deal with Iran. That was 2015, but, but, you know, people learned from that in 2016. We let ISIS expand, grow. We, we barely bombed them. We, we drop leaflets before we drown them. We, we, we wait until the truck drivers get out of their cabs before we bomb the trucks. Uh, we don't bomb the oil facility, so we let ISIS continue to fund itself. It's just unbelievable. It's unthinkable how stupid, sacrificial our policy is. And again, while this is true, 
Well, this is true of, uh, of Obama. This was just as true. This is just as true of George W. Bush. Right? So, uh, it, 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 just pathetic. It's just more obvious under Obama because he's so, in, in, at least Bush talked the talk. He didn't walk the walk, but he talked the talk. Obama talks the opposite talk. He talks the anti-American talk. So he, he at least his uh, actions are consistent with his words. Uh, Libya, where we led from behind and we turned it into an ISIS haven. Uh, Iraq, which has turned into an ally of Iran. Afghanistan, where we know if we leave is going to fall in the hands of the Taliban. It's not even Obama's reversed himself and he's going to keep troops there. Of course, Russia invading Ukraine and and. You know, a few sanctions here and there. Now, I'm not saying we should go to war with Russia. We certainly shouldn't. But it's just our response was so pathetic. It's so weak. It's so uh, unassertive and and, uh, and friendly, ultimately, towards the Russians. China doing whatever it wants in the South China Sea. And again, I'm not saying you go to war against the Chinese for doing that. I still do not consider China an enemy. Uh, but but the fact that they, that they felt that they could get away with it, the fact that they think uh, that they need to do it. I, I think they need to do it for legit. I think they're legitimate Chinese reasons to assert themselves in the South China Sea. If the United States is weak, if the United States is turning against trade, then somebody, somebody better protect, protect the trade routes uh, for China, which is very dependent on trade. And uh, a lot of what they're doing in the South China Sea is an attempt to protect, to protect those trade routes. That's a pretty benevolent interpretation of what the Chinese are doing. But there is that element. As the United States is perceived in the world to be weaker and weaker and weaker, the rest of the world is going to assert itself and become stronger and stronger. So the fact that the Russians would hack a, a, a major political party in the United States and try to affect the election, and don't tell me it didn't happen, it's bullshit. Of course it happened. And we knew it happened three months ago. I mean, I'm shocked by the fact that it's news. It, didn't Donald Trump in some news conference during the election actually encourage the, the Russians to hack the, 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 the Democrats' email? So everybody was talking about this in September, October. I don't know why it's news in December. Of course the Russians hacked. And the fact that they just went into Aleppo and they crushed it, I, you know, I don't necessarily have a problem with that other than I'm no big fan of Assad or Putin. Uh, but I am a... a, 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 a I don't have a problem with actually going to war, uh, doing what's necessary in order to win when you go to war. But the fact that the West said, you can't do it, don't do it, don't do it, and they just ignored it, was just another example of, of the fact that nobody gives us a damn about what the West thinks, about what America thinks, because we're impotent, right? So all this hacking, uh, and uh, I don't know if you saw the story today. There's a story today about, or yesterday, about... Uh, they're finding, finding that the Russians have hacked into uh, some electric utilities in the U.S. They haven't done anything with that hack, but it looks like it's a hack in order to let us know that they can actually shut down electric, the electrical grid in the U.S. if they wanted to. So, and, and again, I, I don't doubt that that's happening. I don't doubt that the, the Russians are trying to tell us, you guys are nothing. And, and they're right. We guys are nothing. We have the mightiest, strongest military force in human history. We still could take on the Chinese and the Russians and crush them. But they know that we're impotent because we're a paper tiger. We will not use our fangs, our claws, or anything. We will not do anything. And, of course, Obama's final parting shot in foreign policy so far has been uh, the abstention at the UN uh, over the uh, uh, Israeli condemnation. Now, I don't want now to spend a lot of time on this because, I, you know, I know I keep promising this, but, but I really will do a show on Israel, and, and I, I really do want to comment on the UN. What an immoral, stupid, ridiculous organization, which America should have nothing to do with and, and should, you know. I, I think I said this when uh, Trump appointed Nikki Haley uh, to the UN. Nikki Haley is way too good to be our ambassador to the UN. You know, you should have, we should appoint a 12-year-old to the UN. He should be a 12-year-old should be ambassador to the UN because that's how seriously we should take the UN. I would have actually supported Trump if he'd appointed a 12-year-old. Maybe his little son, his 8-year-old son, could have been ambassador to the UN. I think that would have been appropriate. Uh, the UN is a ridiculous organization. Not ridiculous, an evil organization. You know, we should be out of it. So anything done at the UN. But the fact that, that, uh, that the Obama administration did something that was clearly anti-Israeli, 
and then uh, had Kerry ha do the speech, which was clearly anti-Israel. It was just more of this, we're not going to support our allies, moral equivalency, there's no difference between the West and everybody else, everybody's equally corrupt, everybody's equally evil, we are nothing, we are nobody. And again, think about the American public. The American public are going, eh, that's not right. We know, not really we know, we feel that we're better than the rest of the world. We feel that we are exceptional, that we are special. And, and again, I think this is what they're rejecting. And even in Europe, what you're seeing is a rise of people saying, wait a minute, Europe is not like everybody else. Europe is different. We're better in some fundamental way. We don't know what that fundamental way is. Maybe it's because we're Christian. Maybe maybe because we're white. Maybe maybe because we're European, whatever the hell that means. Maybe they don't know, right? And they're looking for false, they have lots of false explanations. And this is why you're seeing, I think, in the U.S. and in Europe, the rise, the rise of, of uh, race identity, racism and nationalism and tribalism because people are looking for explanations for why they are, quote, better than everybody else. They don't get it. Almost nobody get it. So it's certainly the intellectuals don't get it. The intellectuals are telling the people, no, you're not better than anybody else. You're not better than the Muslims. You're not better than, than the Africans or the Asians or any other culture. All cultures are the same. Indeed, we in the West, we should feel guilty because we raped and pillaged all these other cultures. So we're worse than all the rest of them. And people are rebelling. People are saying, no, but we're not worse. We're, we're better, but, but, but why are we better? And, and they have no idea. They don't know why we're better. They, they know it can't be because of capitalism, because capitalism doesn't work. They've been told that over and over and over again by the authorities. And they know it can't be because of reason, because they've been told by everybody, and they've been taught by everybody that reason is impotent. And it can be individualism, because Europe's never had individualism, not really, not deep, in a deep sense. And nobody talks about individualism. Nobody knows what it is. Nobody has any concept of what it is. So how could they identify individualism as a unique characteristic to the West when they have not? They have not. Nobody talks about it. Nobody has brought that up. So they are left with nationality, race, history, heritage, religion, something to grab a hold on to. And this is where you get this new identity politics on the so-called right, on the, on, the, on the collectivist right. All right, so let's talk about Europe a little bit. We've already started, obviously. But, uh, you know, Europe, I guess this is really the year in which the migrant crisis became very real uh, within Europe, where... where um, it became a big issue uh, for, for Europeans, uh, uh, over a million, uh, primarily, almost exclusively, uh, Muslim migrants into, uh, into Europe. And I know some of you don't think this is a migration. Some of you think this is an invasion. Some of you think it's a million soldiers marching in or a million, um, uh, a, a million sleeper cells marching in. Again, I don't have time right now to, to deal with, with that nonsense, um, but it is nonsense. Y yeah, some of the people coming in, uh, ISIS, uh, Islamists, some of the people coming in are going to be radicalized over time. But this is not a thought-out, planned invasion right now, uh, and this is not, this is not an army. Uh, you know, here's a question for you, for those of you who are so anti-so-called asylum of any, so-called anti-Muslim immigration, any Muslim immigration, no matter what. Um, and by the way, I've already claimed that I would be against it if war was declared and if we actually, if we actually identified the enemy properly. But, but think about this. I was just this week, uh, the, this woman who is the first female pilot in the Afghan army, in Afghan Air Force. So a woman who, who has uh, gone out there and been unbelievably courageous and death threats all the time, um, got a pilot's license, joined the Air Force in Afghanistan, and became a pilot in the Afghan army. She's a Muslim. I don't think she's an atheist. I don't think she's renounced Islam. She's a Muslim. But she has flouted all the conventions, all the, 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 
you, you know, the Islamists, all the fundamentalists there, and again, daily with death threats, and become this amazing role model for Afghan women who would like to have human rights, basic individual rights for themselves, where they don't have them, not even with the so-called moderate Afghan government. Now, she was in a, uh, a, a training um, exercise here in the United States as part of the Afghan Air Force. And at the end of the training exercise, she decided she did not want to go back to Afghanistan because of the constant, nonstop death threat she was getting. And she has applied for political asylum in the United States. I guess the Trump administration would deny her. And I guess you guys would deny her because she's Muslim. Not all of you guys. Some of you guys would deny her. Because she's Muslim, and, and she's just a sleeper cell. She just could convert to Islamism any moment now, right, and start shooting us and killing us off on the inside. I mean, what a heroic woman. What a, what a, what a, what a you know, what a, what a woman that should be a, a, a symbol of what is possible. And uh, to stand up, this is like the, similar to Ayan Hussein Ali, although Ayan Hussein Ali intellectually went an additional step. But I would grant asylum in a heartbeat. I love of to have a woman. Yes, so she believes she she you know she's going to practice certain things about Islam. You know, you know, many of you practice certain things that I consider pretty pretty weird in Christianity or, or in Judaism or whatever. Um, all right, we've got a bunch of phone calls. Let me take a few phone calls and and then we'll go back to talking about uh, Europe. Hi, you're in the Iran Book Show. Who's this? Aloha. How's it going? Okay. Yeah, I like that. Illiberals. Okay. Illiberals. Let me try that out. Let me try that out. I like that. All right. Good. So this is an alternative to the left. Instead of the left, we'll call them illiberals. Of course, that's true of the right as well. That's the problem. But okay, we can, we, we can associate it with the left. Yeah. Go ahead. I'll get to the good stuff. Don't spoil it. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Absolutely. And CRISPR, just the, the whole existence of CRISPR, this gene, new gene splicing technology, is just um, a gene editing technology is just amazing what they can do today in a fraction of the time what they could do in the past is stunning and and get, it bodes really well for the future so that that and and that became i think much more commercially viable this year um the, the technology has been developed over years but really and of course in the uk now you can use it on on uh, human embryos so uh, the uk is way ahead of the united states on these things all right, great, Stuart. Thanks, and, I, and I've got a few other positives that I'm going to get to for 2006. So don't worry, I'm not going to. I'm not going to end on what a shitty year, and uh, 2017 is going to be even worse. I promise not to do that. <laughs> thanks, Stuart. Thanks for the call. All right, we got one other one other call. A six five one area code. Hi, you on the Iran Book Show? Who's this? Hey, Megan. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Well, I appreciate that. Thank you, Megan. Thank you. <laughs> yep, yep. Oh, wow. Um, you know, I, I, you, we, we can't actually do this, but, um, but uh, uh, let's see. Uh, you know, so, this would be unconstitutional, but what the hell? We're fantasizing, right? Um, 
Uh, Donald Trump and uh, Mike Pence drop dead. Congress appoints John Allison president of the United States. <laughs> no, no, I have no problem with them dropping dead. It's I, I, I'm fine with them dropping dead. I, I'm I'm more concerned about what Congress would do if that happened. I don't think they'd appoint John Allison as president. I don't think it's constitutional for them to do it. I think uh, Speaker of the House becomes president. Uh, but, um, but yeah, that, I mean, somehow if we could get it arranged that so John Allison could become president of the United States, I, I mean, that would be pretty cool, right? Uh, or somebody like John Allison, right? So, um, but I, I don't know. I mean, I, there was a period, there was a period when, um, a few years ago when I was doing these uh, state of air right presentation and I would do a, 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 a slideshow. And uh, to begin the slideshow, to begin the PowerPoint presentation, I would do, uh, this is the world we'd like to see. And I would do these fake news headlines. So I, exactly, and one of them was exactly yours, FDA dismantled. Um, you know, another one would be uh, Federal Reserve dismantled. Uh, the era of, of uh, free banking is now with us. Or, uh, um, you know, we could, yeah, you could, you could do it to every one of the, you could do it to every one of the uh, of the uh, what alphabet soup agencies. SEC dismantled all of those dismantled. But then also, you know, more fundamentally, you could do something like um, uh, Tara Smith appointed to the United States Supreme Court. That would be cool, right? And she's 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 done she's done philosophy of law, so uh, she would be perfect as a Supreme Court. Uh, you know, nominate. You know, nominated. Uh, she she's a philosopher. She's done uh, philosophy of law. She'd be great. Or you know, you could you could do more intellectual stuff rather than just political. Um, you know, so all of that would be cool. And uh, and I hear the baby in the background. So uh, that's fun. <laughs> Wonderful. All right, let me get back because I got a lot still to cover. Well, the uh, babies are the best spiritual fuel. I love love babies, and they, they're incredible motivations. They're incredible motivation. Thanks, Megan. Thanks for calling. Have a great new year. All right, so we are talking about, what are we talking about? We're talking about uh, Europe. Let's start, I'm going to speed this up. Okay, migrant crisis. Europeans can't stand up for themselves. They're just fine with just having a million people cross their border. Um, a little bit of waking up, but but not really, you know, it's just pathetic. And I've talked about the migrant crisis, and I've talked about why it's legitimate to restrict immigration when there's just floods of people coming in because of a civil war. Um, it, 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 they should have restricted immigration uh, in Europe, but they can't. They have no leg to stand on. We saw the rise, uh, the increased uh, terrorism all over Europe. We saw the... Uh, you know, these uh, radicalized individuals we saw in the United States as well with San Bernardino and, and uh, the nightclub in Orlando. These radicalized individuals uh, just gaining a weapon. And, and you can see the gun control doesn't help because in Europe they have gun control. People don't have guns, so they use their cars as, as weapons. If, if somebody's intent on killing you, they will find a way to kill you. They, they don't necessarily need a rifle or a gun. Uh, we, we, we've lived through massive economic stagnation. Uh, Italy, Greece, Deutsche Bank on the verge of collapse, French banks, Italian banks being bailed out right now. Uh, Europe is stagnating. It's not collapsing, but it is stagnating. And some of the countries within Europe are in deep, deep trouble. And, and Greece has not gone away. 2017, you're going to see the return of Greece as a problem. It's going to be very interesting to watch the, the, the Trump administration deal with that. Um, Italy is going to become a big problem in 2017, and if Italy becomes a big problem, expect Spain and France to be problems as well, although I think Spain is doing more positive reforms than the rest of many other countries in Europe. Generally, all of this driven by a general skepticism about European identity, what does it mean to be European, uh, skepticism about the whole European project, about, you know, so... People reject the whole European Union thing, and they view the, the whole European Union thing as a bad deal. And I disagree. I disagree. The, 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 the idea of the European Union was a great idea. The idea of creating a place that had a uniform currency, so getting rid of the transaction costs 
associated with replacing currencies and crossing borders and having lots of different currencies. And securing free movement of, tri- of goods, capital, and labor. That is a wonderful idea. That is a fantastic idea. In the European Union, it is actually tragic that it has failed. And it's failed because on top of that unity, of, of, um, or on top of doing away with all these barriers to trade, capital, and movement, they also introduced massive regulations in order to create uniform regulations at- across the entire European bloc. So the, the failure of the European Union is in the government's attempt to control the economy of the entire Union. Well, any attempt of government to control the economy is bad, but when they try to do it uniformly across the entire Union, it has devastating consequences. So it's the uniform labor laws, it's the uniform subsidies, it is the, uh, for, for green energy or whatever, it is the uniform, uh, uniform, uh, uniform regulations uh, and, and uh, in the attempt to have uniform tax codes. All of that has been a disaster. But the idea of free trade, the idea of free movement of people, capital, and goods, that is a brilliant idea. And that's an idea that should be embraced by more countries, not fewer countries. So European identity, the skepticism about European identity has led to skepticism of the entire European project, which has led to skepticism of the European Union, and they're going to throw the baby out with the bathwater. That is not skepticism towards trade. It's skepticism towards immigration. It's skepticism towards free movement of capital. And by the way, immigration here, I'm talking about just migration within the European Union. So I'm not talking about the Muslims coming in or Africans coming in. I'm just talking about within the European Union, European citizens moving from country to country without showing a passport, without any restrictions. I love it. When I go to Europe, you enter once. And then you go all these other countries and you don't do passport control. It's like going from one state to another within the United States. And that's great. There's nothing wrong with that. That's fantastic. But the problem is that there is no sense of European identity. Therefore, there's no sense of what it means to be European. And therefore, now replace the idea of being European or Western civilization is going to be nationalism, Brexit, was the first sign of it. Now, again, I was for Brexit. I'm still for Brexit. But because I assume that England or the United Kingdom, separate from Europe, will institute pro-free market policies that the Europeans would not have allowed them to institute. Now, that's yet to be proven. Instead, they could very much institute anti-free market policies nationalist policies, tribalist, collectivist policies, and be much worse off than if they'd stayed with with, uh, the European Union. So they could take the worst of the European Union, the regulations and controls, instead of the best, and deny the best, which was free trade, free movement of capital, free movement of labor. So it's still to be determined whether Brexit will turn out to be a good thing or a bad thing. Italy's vote against the prime minister was just stupid. The, the constitutional reforms that were being proposed were actually good, and they were good for the people. They, were, they, they, they actually made a lot of sense, and people voted against it because it, it was proposed by a sitting prime minister, and we're against anybody who's sitting. Right? We want them to be standing or something like that. Right? Next year, you can have France, you can have Netherlands, who are moving way to the right, not just any way to the right, collectivist right, uh, good builders who's good on some issues around Islam, not good on other issues around Islam, and is terrible when it comes to domestic policy, terrible when it comes to pretty much everything else. He's a, he's a, he's a horrible, horrible representative of this nationalist, tribalist, collectivist attitude that might be, we might share the suspicion of Islam or the hatred of Islam with them, but nothing beyond that. So in France, Marie Le Pen who I think is awful and dangerous and, and, and horrific. But this is what's going to grow in Europe. This, this is where we're heading, and we're seeing, we're seeing the fervor. We're seeing all of this really rise up uh, this year. All right, I'm running out of time, and all I'm, gonna, I'm not going to have time to do anything positive or to get to anything interesting because this is just a laundry list of really bad things that are happening. Right? All right, let's... let's complete the laundry list with a few uh, horrible things happening in America, culturally and economically. 
I mean, culturally, I think there were maybe the two most important things that happened this year. And again, I think they started in 15, but really got full steam ahead in 16 with the election and with everything else. And that is the police shootings and the response to police shootings. And I did a couple of shows about this, so you know my attitude towards police shootings. I think there's a real problem there. I, I think some of these police shootings are horrible. When, when somebody's on the ground and a policeman stands above them and empties a, empties a whole cartridge of bullets into, into the person, I mean, something is wrong with that specific policeman. And when you see it, and a few occurrences, you have to question at least whether there's something in the culture of some of these police forces, whether there's something endemic, and whether there's something that can be done about it. And uh, I, I believe that, uh, you know, this, there has to be some significant increase in police training on how to use a weapon, when to use a weapon. I've used weapons. I know how to use a weapon. You don't, when, when you're, you know, when you're pointing a gun, it has to be in the face of a real life-threatening situation. And I don't care if you're a policeman or not a policeman. You don't just shoot people. You don't just shoot people. So I think there's training that has to be done there. But then there was the response to police shooting, which the most dominant response was that by Black Lives Matter. Now, there were two responses, one by the so-called conservatives who will defend anything a policeman ever does, and it doesn't matter how horrific it is. They will defend it to the death. And that was ridiculous. And then there was the opposite response, which was Black Lives Matter, and they would defend the person being shot no matter what happens, whether they, were, whether they had uh, done something bad to deserve being shot or not. Didn't matter. And then, of course, into the whole Black Lives Matter, into the whole shootings issue, they wrapped into that a whole Marxist, anti-capitalist, anti-individualism, anti-American agenda so I, I'm, I, I've promised to do a show on Black Lives Matter, and I will do a show on Black Lives Matter. But Black Lives Matter took a legitimate issue, which is some of these police shootings look really, really bad, and there is real question about whether they are or not uh, politically or, or racially motivated. And uh, that, that that issue of being racially motivated is a real issue. And they took that legitimate issue of trying to evaluate what was really going on and then turning it into a radical, nihilistic, emphasis on nihilistic, capital N. This is just not an illiberal. This was a nihilistic campaign to destroy everything Western, everything capitalist, everything uh, that is associated with Western civilization. And it was crude. It was disgusting. And, and Black White Matters is, it represents an evil, bad ideology, an evil, bad framework. So I, I'm going to do a whole show on this because I think it deserves some attention in its nuance, and particularly in the sense in which they combine something that's right, that we should be upset about, racism, with uh, packaging it with a lot of really, really bad stuff, the attack on, on Western civilization. So Black Lives Matters came into its own uh, during 2016. Uh, social justice warriors. Uh, now, again, they've been around for a while, but they gained a lot of prominence because of the election. They were very active because of election. But what made them more prominent, it, what made them particularly stand out, is the fact that they, for the first time, I think, got a systematic response from the so-called alt-right. They got a systematic response in their own language, it was using their own methodology on social media, trying to be so-called funny by the alt-right. By a by by and the alt left and the alt right are not different philosophically. They're both the same creepy, evil, collectivist, racist, social justice warriors, and the alt right are the same. They are philosophically two sides of exactly the same tribalistic, collectivistic, emotionalistic, irrational, evil coin. And don't tell me there's no such thing as alt right. I know somebody's going to go out there, oh, you're on, there's no such thing as alt right. You're just exaggerating. Ask Ben Shapiro if there's no such thing as, uh, as the alt right. Here's a, here's a good, good guy. Where's he, Yarmikas? He's religious, right? So he's not 100% on my side. But man, the anti Semitic stuff that he got, the threats, the, and not just by one or two people, right? And, and, and he's on the so called right, but you know what he dared to do? 
You know what he did to do? He did not to support Donald Trump. And man, did they go after him. He, they went after him much worse than they went after me. They went after me a little bit, but they went after Ben Shapiro. Oh my, I mean, it was absurd, right? So they are around, they exist, they are dangerous, and they are being emboldened by Trump. And, 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 and Bannon is, at, at the very least, a sanctioner of the alt-right, if not a card-carrying member of the alt-right. So, and he's right in the hub of power. So the rise of the alt-right as a, as a uh, force, an anti-force of the social justice warriors, very scary. Very scary. People who used to hide, people who used to hide under rocks because they, even they, were embarrassed by the stupidity and evilness of their ideas. Is there such a word as evilness? Evil of their ideas. There's no ness at the end. Anyway, evilness sounds good. It sounds more, it it places an emphasis on the word, Uh, of their ideas. They're crawling out from under the rocks and thumping their chests. They're proud of being racists. They're proud of the Hitler-like salutes. They're proud of of the tweets with Nazi slogans and Nazi symbols. They're proud of their anti-civilized attitude. And that's on left and right. Again, I don't think there's a difference. That's on the social justice warrior and on alt-right sides. Both Two sides of exactly the same coin, coin, both disgusting, offensive, and ridiculous. And it's not just on the internet. You know, you can find these people everywhere. I meet them everywhere, unfortunately. Uh, As we said, free speech under attack everywhere. And and, And something new, I thought, this year, more so than any other year because it was an election year, partisanship, the hatred of the other side, not just we disagree, not just we dislike you, but we hate you. You're bad, you're evil, you, we can't talk to you. The way the right described the left and the left described the right and the way they lived in their own bubbles and their own echo chambers and they, there was no cross-communication and there was no, there was no sense among the American people of, well, I like some things here and I like some things there. No, you bought into the whole package or you didn't buy into the whole package. Um, just a, 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 people have talked about partisanship for years, and I kind of fru, fru part it, fru part, that's the word, fru part it, or poo part it, or whatever, fru part, I think, fru part it, and no, it's real, man, this year it really came together, people coalesced, people who I thought would never, never vote for Donald Trump coalesced around him because he was not left, he was not the Democrats, ooh, we can't have anybody but a Democrat, you know, other than it. So that, God forbid you, voting for Hillary was considered a mortal sin. You went to hell for voting for Hillary. Immediately, instantly, you went to hell. Now, I don't know because I didn't vote for hell. It could be that those people who did vote for Hillary went to hell immediately, instantly. Although I think they're still around. Um, and they're 50% of the population. But you, you couldn't do that. It was like, so if people voted for Donald Trump because they hated the other side in a way that I've never seen in politics before. And of course, people hate Donald Trump again. Now, this has been getting worse and worse. I think it was true already with Obama, although there were a lot of people in the middle who kind of didn't like Obama but still voted for him. They didn't love him. Now it was all love or hate. Or, you know, it was all very, very emotional, which is, again, a theme of the year, the year of emotion. Both sides, both sides rejecting facts. And this is the scary thing, celebrating the fact that they reject facts. Both left and right now are proud of being in the post-factual era. It's an era where you don't have to present facts. You can make them up. You can pretend. False news on both sides, left and right, freely creating false news because the goal is to get elected. The goal is to gain power, and then we can drain the swamp. Oh, you know, our swamp, their swamp, or whatever, right? Everybody has their own swamp. All right, so, you know, here we are, here we are, that's our culture as of 20, end of 2016. Economy, and I'm going to spend a lot of time on this, you know, stagnation, slow economic growth, cronyism everywhere you look, 
government intervention everywhere you look, government involvement in the economy and in companies, and, and, and in a sense, 2016 it ended with the ultimate act of cronyism with the Donald Trump and Carrier. Uh, you know, just, just this is again crawling from under a rock. It used to be that when you did cronyism, you were embarrassed by it. You did it, you hid away. You did it in, in a dark room somewhere and, and the check was slipped under the table and uh, nobody reported it as a headline. Now with Donald Trump, it's cronyism out in the open. It's proud cronyism. We're proud of our cronyism. It's cronyism as Americanism. And that's what the, that's what the carrier deal really was. You do it way out there. Right? Let, me, let me just clarify for those of you who think Donald Trump gave them a tax cut. Donald Trump cannot or should not be able to constitutionally give me a tax cut. If Donald Trump came into my office tomorrow and said, you're on, from now on, you don't have to pay taxes, that should be unconstitutional, certainly immoral. We should be a land of laws, not of men. We should be, we should have equality before the law, not granting special favors to those who you like. Yes, Carrier gets less money stolen from them, so I get more money stolen from me. That's not justice. That's not rights protection. That's the exact opposite. You cannot believe in free markets and believe in the carrier deal. You cannot believe in individual rights and believe the carrier deal is right. Please, if you believe the deal with carrier was right, please don't call yourself a defender of capitalism. Please don't call yourself a defender of individual rights. And therefore, please don't call yourself an objectivist. This is, this is fascism. That's what it is. It's when, the, it's when the rulers get to decide who get favors from whom. Who gets to pay so-called less taxes? Who do we steal less from and who do, we give, who do we steal more from? That's not the rule of law. That's not constitutional government. That is not the rule of laws, but the rule of men. That is what characterizes fascism. And that... Now you got me all pessimistic. That's where we're heading. All right, so we're in a, we're in, we've got cronyism up the wazoo. Uh, wealth redistribution in all directions, from industries that we like to industries that we don't like, which has always been happening, but now it's going to be happen. Industries that make stuff in America and industries that don't make stuff in America, businesses that employ people in America, people who don't employ people in America, all kinds of new redistribution of wealth and redistribution of favor schemes uh, and, uh, and uh, 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 distractions, right? All right, and uh, you know, the regular story state completely out of control. And this is part of what I think the rebellion of the America, America working class was. It's, it's, it's so absurd. I mean, I had examples for you guys uh, from, a, from a piece by another uh, anti-Trump intellectual who I mostly like, although he's also anti-Ayn Rand, Brett Stevens, and he, he had a great piece in the Wall Street Journal, which I recommend, on December 19th, and, and he, gave, he gave some examples of, uh, of some of the ridiculous regulations, and you know the big ones like, like Sarbanes-Oxley and like Obamacare and like Dodd-Frank, those are the biggest ones, but you do you know that according to the Labor Department, you have to if you're going to be a contractor, a subcontract with the government, you have to have 7% of your workforce be disabled. 7% of your workforce has to be disabled. And to achieve this goal, listen to this. This is this direct quote, right? You tell me if you understand this sentence. Quote, contractors must conduct an annual utilization analysis and assessment of problem areas and establish specific action-oriented programs to address any identified problems. In other words, you have to go and do an assessment of how many people are disabled. And if you don't have enough, e I guess, either disable the existing workforce or go find new people to, who are disabled. I don't know. I mean, the government leaves you the option of choosing how you get 7% disabled people. Now, think about this. These are contractors, subcontractors that might be in the construction business. In other words, you have to have 7% disabled people, right? I mean, this is insanity. Or OSHA. 
recently banned blanket policies on post-accident drug testing. So one of your employees has an accident, you can't test them for drugs because that might be discriminatory, right? Now, OSHA also decided to adopt the UN's 2003 globally harmonized systems of classification and labeling of chemicals. So how we label chemicals has to be standardized based on UN standards. Now this required, and it was implemented over the last couple of years, this required relabeling and reclassifying done by companies in the US. Do you know what cost, how much it cost? 2.1 billion dollars, not million, 2.1 billion dollars in compliance. Now who do you think is paid for that? Or do you know that if you deliver something that a driver that makes a delivery within Seattle city limits must earn a minimum wage of $15 an hour, even if the company is based outside of Seattle, even if nobody lives in Seattle, even if the company has no branches in Seattle, if he makes a delivery in Seattle, he has to make 15 bucks an hour. Now I can see trucks lining up on the city limit of, 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 of Seattle and switching the cargo from one truck to the next just to avoid this. But this is the kind of nuttiness, right? Nuttiness. So the city of San Francisco, fair chance ordinance forbids employers from asking about convictions or arrests on a job application. So we don't want to know if you're a rapist or a murderer or something like that, it's irrelevant to this particular job. I wonder if that's true at, at like, I don't know, government-run uh, kindergartens, which I'm sure San Francisco has. So, yeah, yeah, we're fed up. People are fed up. This is absurd. This is ridiculous. People are pissed off. So what do we elect instead? What do we, what do we choose instead of this? Right? Instead of this insanity, instead of this uh, craziness, right? What is the, what have we chosen to replace the illiberal left with? Oh, with an illiberal right. We've chosen to replace it not with ideas, not with policies based on individualism, not with more freedom, not with more reason, now, we haven't said, you know, this craziness on campus. What we need now is, is to rediscover reason and rediscover dialogue and to rediscover speaking and rediscover free speech. No. What we want is to yell louder than the other guy. What we want is to be able to, you know, offend them as much as they offend us. Now, I'm all for offending. I'm all for the right of the alt-right to say what they want to say. But is this the answer? Is this the answer to the social justice warriors, the alt-right? Is the answer to 16 years of horrific foreign policy to elect somebody, to elect somebody who is a fan of Putin's, to elect somebody who can't hold a position on foreign policy for more than 48 hours without flip-flopping on it, who doesn't have any kind of sense of the world, no principles. I have not heard Donald Trump articulate a single principle. Yes, he says America first. But I'd like to know what that means to Donald Trump because based on what it means to him with regard to trade, he has no concept of what America first means. So I doubt he understands it in foreign policy and I've seen no articulation of what it means in foreign policy. any kind of principle. So the response to the left has been anger, frustration, emotion, emotional outcry. But that's not the American sense of life. It's not being don't tread on me, which was there during the Tea Party. No, this is post Tea Party. What you saw in 2016 is post Tea Party. 26, in, in, in the Tea Party, it was still the American sense of life. But the American sense of life is weak. It's very, very weak. When Ayn Rand talked about the American sense of life, it was 50, 40, 
years ago? 35 years ago? 35 years of postmodernist leftists that even Ayn Rand couldn't, well, I guess you could imagine, but she put it in a fiction, not in a nonfiction. Pounding on the American people over and over and over again. Presidents who do nothing against this intellectual pounding, who indeed stand for nothing and who bankrupted this country culturally, found policy-wise and economically. You think the American sense of life, which Ayn Rand already identified as weak in the 70s, has withstood all that? Well, we know it didn't. Because we know that the American sense of life did not respond to 9-11 the way the American sense of life would have responded to 9-11 if it had happened 30 years earlier. It certainly didn't respond to 9-11 like it responded to Pearl Harbor. And, it, and, and listen, I, all of you should go back and listen to Leonard Peikoff's, I think it's 2003, Fort Hall Forum lecture called America, no, Americans versus America, where he identifies the, 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 the almost death of the American sense of life, and he says Americans are now working against America. And all I can say is 2016 is more of that deeper than of that. And I know you're going to be pissed off, right? I have to say it like I see it, guys. And you want to be Pollyannish about this? You want to, every time Trump says, I, I know you guys, every time Trump says something good, like he takes the phone call from the Taiwanese prime minister, a president, and I go, yeah, I, I, would, I think he should take the phone call, right? I think that's good. Or he stands up to, he calls Castro a really bad guy. And I go, yeah, that's good. And you guys go, yeah, that's good. But then he does 55 horrible things, and you guys says, oh, he doesn't mean that. That's not important. You, you, you focus on the good things, and you ignore the bad things. It's not a good sign. That's not being objective. To be objective, either take his word or don't take his word, but you can't be selective on what you take it as word and what you don't take it as word. You can't rewrite the laws of economics to make Tr uh, you know, trade barrier is a good thing, you know, to justify Donald Trump. Donald Trump does not come before reality. Reality comes first. Facts come first. His position on, on, on trade, his position on almost, on, on, on a lot of what he does is so anti-factual, so anti-reality, so anti-freedom that, that, come on, people. Now, again, he might be a great, he might be fine, right? But you don't know that. Because he's a complete, utter pragmatist. He has no principles, and he will be the first to admit that. He is a proud pragmatist. And then there are those of you who love Milo. Right? Milo, Milo represents the American sense of life. First of all, he's a Brit. You can't have an American sense of life with a British accent. I'm sorry. But Milo's the anti-American sense of life. Milo represents exact Europeanization of America. Milo is cynical. He's nihilistic. He's anti, 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 anti. What's he for? What does Milo stand for? Now, yes, some of the time he says some really good stuff and he shatters political correctness. I'm, and this is what Donald Trump did. I'm all for shattering political correctness. The problem with Donald Trump is he's creating his own political correctness. Milo Granite doesn't believe in political correctness. Good for him. But that's not the American sense of life. The American sense of life is not anti. The American sense of life is pro. It's pro-individualism. Deep down, it's about leave me alone. Not protect me. Protect me against Chinese. They're going to they're gonna, they're gonna take my job. Protect me against those Mexicans. They're going to kill my kids. Protect me against Muslims. They're going to slaughter all of us. Protect, protect, protect. That's, that's what we got today. We've got a bunch of, I don't know, I'm not going to say it. Um, wimps. I was going to use a, a, more, a worse word than that. We got a bunch of wimps in this country and, and who, who voted for Donald Trump out of, out of, now I'm not saying all of you did. I, I know, again, you get it. A lot of you voted for Donald Trump because you hated Hillary and, and, you, and you saw some hope of good in Donald Trump. Fine. 
I'm not talking about you. I'm talking about those of you who are enthusiastic about Donald Trump. You know, this is emotion. This is anger. This is uh, this is rebellion, and of course, it's an appeal to tribalism. What Donald Trump did with the America First, and and it, what's he meaning about right now? I'm committing that my state. You know, I I I I, uh, I had this Ben Shapiro. Has a great, let me let me give a plug to this op-ed by Ben Shapiro, which is excellent. Um, it, it was published just a few days ago, uh, December 29th, so two days ago. Um, it's about Trump's tweet. Trump sent out this meme, and it says, "Whoops, I started uh, this uh, music. We're going to shut it down." Okay, uh, the meme says, "My administration will follow two simple rules: buy American and hire American." Now. We have an op-ed written by Harry Ben Swanger, written years and years ago, years and years ago, as true today as ever, that is titled, Buy American is Un-American. So, Buy American, High American is Un-American. It's Un-American. That's what the American sense of life says. Get off my back. I will hire whoever I want to. I will take my plant wherever I want to, and I will buy whatever goddamn good from whatever goddamn place I want to. It's none of your business. That's what America's, that's what don't tread on me. This isn't don't tread on me. This is nationalism. This is tribalism disguised as Americanism. Americanism is the opposite of tribalism. Americanism is the opposite of collectivism. Americanism is the opposite of Trumpism. And, and by the way, this op-ed by Ben Shapiro is one of the reasons I can be a little optimistic going into 2017 because it's obvious to me that Ben Shapiro has read Ayn Rand. It's obvious to me that she's had an impact on him. I would not be surprised that he's read Harry Binswanger's uh, 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 you know, uh, um, article about this. It's so explicitly. Listen to the last sentence. last sentence of this op-ed says, We're citizens with rights. And those rights include our right to engage in commerce that makes our lives better. And I would add, although this is what he means, with whomever we choose, none of your business, federal government, stay off our backs. Good for Ben Shapiro. I really like this guy, in spite of the fact that he wears a yarmulke. I'll take his yarmulke over a lot of secularists out there. Um, anyway, I'm almost out of time. And I haven't covered a fraction of what I wanted to. All right, let me, um, I'm going to go over time. So this is going to be a show that's over over an hour and a half. Sorry, guys, but we, we're just going to go over this. Um, so, yes, population in the West, in America, and in Europe has rebelled against the bankruptcy of the illiberal left it's it, it, the it has rebelled against the corruption, the cultural, economic, and political corruption, and I mean spirit, spiritual, deep, deep corruption, not just you know the fact that they're corrupt financially. Corruption of the elites of the status quo, but they have rebelled like little three-year-olds, and 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 they they have they have chosen one evil, they've replaced one evil with another, and again it. It might turn out that Donald Trump will be okay, but it's why he was elected and how he was elected that, I'm sorry, I don't buy into it, fire me, right? Um, and I'll, I'll talk about being fired in a minute. Anyway, <laughs> um, so this is not good. This is not the American sense of life. This is not the American sense of life. The American sense of life would not have voted for Somebody who used, and I've mentioned this tactic over and over again, but it's still true. The tactic of Donald Trump was, one, scare the American people like crazy by making up false news about uh, crime rates, illegal immigrants, Muslims coming into this country, and the horrible things that they're going to do to all of us by making the economy seem even worse than it already is. It's bad, but it, making it even worse and, and making, making it seem like we're even worse than we are. There are a lot of things that are bad, but making things much worse. We're scaring up Jesus off of us. Then, blaming not our ideas or our policies or who we voted for in the past, 
but blaming foreigners for this, Chinese, Japanese, Koreans, Mexicans, and Muslims for all of our problems, and then saying, trust me, voting for that is not the American sense of life. Yeah, once in a while, because he's non-PC, Donald Trump will say something outrageous and we go, yeah, that's cool that somebody in power is willing to say that. But it's meaningless giving who it comes from and giving everything else he says. And, and you have to evade so much in order to latch on to this, just this one thing. Again, might turn out to be okay because he's a pragmatist. Say, so it might turn out that the few pragmatic things that he does are going to be fine. I'm skeptical because he's committed to this trade stuff, and that's long-term a disaster for this country. All right, I want to go through some positives for 2016, and then I want to tell you why I have hope for 2017, although I don't know how I come back from the depressing statements I just made. Um, some good stuff that happened in 2016. ISIS and its satellites are being defeated. Now, this is localized. It's not the defeat of Islamic totalitarianism or jihadism or Islamism. But these organizations, and I think defeating them helps. Every defeat helps. Every time we defeat somebody else. But ISIS is going to be defeated in 2017, 2018. It's already on the defensive. It's already lost most of its ground. And I think it's going to lose a lot of the inspiration it provides for these terrorists all over the world to attack us because it's losing ground. People are much more likely to volunteer to fight for a cause that's winning than to fight for a cause that's losing. ISIS, that specific manifestation of the Islamist cause, is on the defensive. And Boko Haram, the, 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 the ISIS satellite in Nigeria, is almost being wiped out. So the good news there is Nigerian government about a year ago got serious. They unleashed the, the military on them and they have crushed them. And... Good for the Nigerians, good for Africa to get rid of this, this and, and hopefully this will be a trend of at least on a local level, not, you know, it should be much bigger, it should be ideological, but, you know, we should be really at war with them and wipe them out, but at least locally, this happened in 2016, it's good. Anytime these bad guys, these bastards are defeated, it's a good thing. Russia and China. Now, they made a lot of progress standing up to the United States Ultimately, but look, these are both corrupt, horrific regimes. China is becoming worse and worse, particularly internally. Uh, it's becoming much, much more authoritarian. They're putting many more people in jail now. It's becoming more and more difficult to speak out in China. A, a lot of my, my friends in China are in deep trouble over there and I think uh, are really worried about their futures as professors and so on in China. Uh, but the good news there is both China and Russia are weak. They're weak militarily. They're weak economically. Uh, Russia's basically bankrupt economically. It's, it's, it's pounding its chest, but there's nothing there. Uh, th there was talk about Donald Trump's tweets about a nuclear arms race. There's no nuclear arms race. R Russia can't afford one. I mean, it, it has no money. Even if oil go stays at $50 a barrel, uh, it, it just it's not enough to keep the Russian economy uh, doing well, and at some point the Russians are, are going to get upset by the fact that they, their economy is stagnating. China, uh, equally, their the, the economic policies over the last, I'd say since 2008 at least, have been bad. This new president is awful. Uh, they're, doing, they're doing very negative things in terms of their, their, their economy, in terms of free speech, in terms of political liberalization. And I'm not worried about China. I think China is going gonna, is gonna to decline as long as they don't continue to liberalize, and they know there's no signs of Chinese liberalizing, uh, further liberalization of their economy anywhere to be seen. So in spite of the fact that they are rattling the sabers, they will not be war with China in 2017, and they will not be war with China in 2017. The U.S. economy in 2016, not great, but not terrible. It wasn't horrible. Wages picked up quite a bit, so average wages were up uh, quite a bit. It caught up with productivity. So uh, a lot of the top line numbers were actually good. Job growth, again, not great, not spectacular. 160, 170,000 jobs a month, most of them in the private sector. That, those are good numbers. Those are not great numbers. They're nowhere near the numbers that should be or could be. 
but they're not horrible numbers. It's not the hysteria again of a Donald Trump and of the, 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 the panic that people had about how bad 2016 was. Uh, wage growth was robust during 2016 uh, across uh, all the income levels. Lots of problems. The Federal Reserve is still screwing up this economy. And as I said, the regulations are still problematic. But I take 2016 as one more year to go down as thumbs up for the resilience of the U.S. economy in spite of all the obstacles. We did pretty well. Um, gay marriage. Gay marriage is great. Um, I think it's a fantastic thing and it's spreading around the world and good for gays. And we should celebrate that. So sometimes when the left wins, it's a good thing. And, and I'm all for that. And you know what? This whole transgender thing, good for transgender people. You know, I, I think too much is made of this. I have my own qualms about the whole phenomena. But what the hell? Politically, you know, they have, they have, they have individual rights, just like anybody else has individual rights. Um, more freedom in the world. There's definitely more freedom in the world today than there was five years ago. Certainly more than there was 10, 15, 20, 30, 40 years ago. So, you know, small steps in the right direction. I don't have time to go all of them. And people are waking up, and I'll get to that in a minute. And a great Olympics in Rio de Janeiro, one of my favorite cities in the world. They, they, you know, everybody, just like always, we live for Armageddon. We live for complete and utter disaster. We live for the collapse of everything. We kind of eager for it. And that was, everybody was talking about that before the Rio Olympics. Eh, everything was fine, you know, other than that stupid American swimmer making up the stupid story. You know, the, the, it was a fun, yeah, and the pool turning a wrong color and a few other things that were shady. Overall, I had a blast this Olympics. I enjoyed it. It was a celebration of human achievement and human success. I love it every four years. And, and to see Rio de, Rio de Janeiro pull it off in spite of everything, you know, Great. The Chicago Cubs won a World Series. That has to be one of the highlights of 2016. I'm cool with that. As a, as a Boston Red Sox fan, I was, I was cool with the Cubs winning. I thought that was cool. And then I think Stuart mentioned it. I was going to mention it anyway. CRISPR, and I'm sure there are lots of other technology, technological, wonderful technological innovations. CRISPR is one of the most exciting ones, one of the most interesting ones. It, look it up. Um, this new gene splicing technology, I think this is going to revolutionize healthcare, has the potential to if the FDA doesn't kill it. This is why it's, it's happening, uh, more of it's happening in Europe, because Europe, they're more lenient about these things, they're less, they're less Christian about them. Um, uh, you know, so a lot of stuff happened in technology that is exciting. Uh, there were some breakthroughs on so-called AI. I don't like the term AI, but, but uh, computers are getting, are getting more sophisticated, uh, being able to deal with more complex problems um, I'm a huge pro-technology guy, and I think technology is going to do fantastic things. Uh, and uh, those of you, and, and you should, you know, you should, um, you guys should look into, you know, science, particularly in biology, there's some exciting things going on. Uh, I don't know enough about physics. I'm suspicious of physics, but, uh, but my, my sense is that there's still some sanity, some, not complete, some, Sanity, certainly in technology, certainly in innovation, uh, in some insights. All right, quickly, 2017. Uh, Trump's going to be very mixed. He's going to do some good things, like he'll cut some regulations, some emphasis on some. Uh, he will um, cut taxes, some. I don't believe my taxes will go down. I believe my rate will go down, and the amount of deductions and exclusions I'll have will, go, uh, will, will be eliminated. Everything else held constant, that's better than the, than the alternative, but I would rather pay less taxes, which I don't think will happen. Um, so tax simplification, that's good. Um, regulate, cutting regulations will go, that's good. But increased regulation when it comes to who you hire, where you hire from. Increased regulations on immigration. Immigration is bigger government, guys. Immigration control is bigger government. You like small government, you should be pro-immigration. I'm not saying open borders tomorrow. But pro-immigration is small government, limiting immigration, constraining immigration, that's big government. Um, big government is buy America. Big government is tariffs, all of that dangerous stuff. We're not going to have a war with Russia and China, forget it. ISIS probably will, will, will collapse in 17, that's good news. Iran, I'm still hoping for that revolution internally. Um, 
I guarantee this, Trump will do nothing about Iran, and the deal with Iran will not be renegotiated. And if it is, it'll be trivial. The economy, comedy will do great. This is my prediction for 17. Good year for the economy, good year for stocks, bad year for bonds. 18, 19, I'm not so sure. I think we're going to get a, I think we're heading for a recession. The bubble, there's, there's definitely a bubble here caused by the Federal Reserve. It's going to, my, this is my, my long-term economic prediction. We're going to do, have a good economy. It's going to be robust. Bank lending's going to go up. Inflation's going to rear its ugly head. The Federal Reserve will overreact and we'll get a recession. Okay. Trade disaster. Read the Ben Shapiro op-ed. It's excellent. Could we wake up? Well, maybe. I mean, in a healthy way, right? From one form of emotional tantrum to another form of emotional tantrum, that's not really waking up. I'm talking about intellectually waking up. Well, that depends on you guys. And on me, but on you guys. It means we have to wake up. We have to fight. We have to make our voices heard. And that does not mean becoming accolades of Donald Trump. It means criticizing him and criticizing him and criticizing him. It means being at the forefront of what a policy of pro-individualism, pro-capitalism actually means. It means, if you listen to my previous show from last week, I gave an agenda for the first 100 days of what Donald Trump should do. We should advocate for that and holding up to that standard. Not, oh, wonderful, he cut my taxes a little bit, but he kept spending the way it is. Then it makes no difference if he cut taxes ultimately. So a real agenda, let's push for it. We have to advocate, for it. And, but more importantly, we have to advocate for an intellectual agenda, not a political agenda, which means an agenda that's pro-reason, pro-individualism. We have to evaluate every political act on the basis of does this move towards more individualism or less individualism, more freedom or more statism. Not Americanism the way Donald Trump defines it, the way so many of you. So whether we wake up intellectually is up to us. So 2017 has to be the year that you start fighting aggressively to defend America. By the way, somebody mentioned this in the chat. I don't know why you're making such a big deal out of 2016 in terms of celebrities dying. One, I, I know this sounds heartless, but who cares? I mean, I, I, these are pop stars. I mean, give me a break. These are not world-changing philosophers. These are not brilliant scientists. These are popular. Yeah, okay. Somebody, you know, people die. Second, you know why more celebrities are dying? Because they're more celebrities. That's all, because we are a frigging rich culture that can afford to obsess over stupid what, you know, what... Uh, What's the name? No celebrity's name is popping into my mind. That tells you, tells you how, how little I pay attention to popular culture. How Paris Hilton, this is a celebrity from years ago, what she's wearing, who the hell cares? So the, we have so many celebrities today that it's diminished the meaning of celebrity. And we have had for 30, 40 years. So pop stars from when I was growing up are starting to die now. Yeah, they're old. Sorry for my insensitivity. I'm not in a sensitive mood. Um, <laughs> all right, so we need to intel. And, and this, is, this is my hopeful comment, my two-second hopeful comment. I think young people outside of the United States are waking up. I think there's a global phenomena out there of young people saying, we've had it being poor. We've had it being unfree. We want, we want to live in freedom. And Ayn Rand today is more popular outside of the United States than, than she's ever been before. And she's selling well in the U.S. So what we need, what we need is to really push Ayn Rand. Let's take advantage of the fact that every media outlet in the universe right now is talking about Ayn Rand because so-called this is an Ayn Rand cabinet. To differentiate between us and Donald Trump. Differentiate. That means don't embrace it means differentiate. Let's emphasize the differences. Emphasize what makes Ayn Rand unique. Emphasize what makes her philosophy exciting to people personally, particularly to the young. Let's really go out there and get the young excited about Ayn Rand. So, 
You've still got a few hours to contribute to the Ayn Rand Institute, the only organization in the world that's doing this in a systematic way, and get a tax deduction in 2016. So end 2016 in a positive way. Go online, or I think the post office is still open, so you can actually mail a check as long as it's postmarked today, and you get a tax deduction if you still itemize your deductions. But you should do it anyway. $10, $35, $50, a million dollars, whatever, right? That's the only, I mean, I'm sorry, I I know this is pretty self-centered, but the only hope the universe has is Ayn Rand. So support getting the wood out. Maybe the universe is an exaggeration because there might be other species out there that are more sensible than this crazy species. Um, The human race's only hope is Ayn Rand. So uh, let's get Ayn Rand out there. And that needs your financial help. I'm, pu- I'm pumped up about our ability to do that. Right? And one of the reasons I'm pumped up is that today is my last show ever. Well, ever might be a, well, my last show ever, I think, as CEO of the Ayn Rand Institute. So I am no longer the chief executive officer of the Ayn Rand Institute. We have just hired a new chief executive officer. He starts on Monday. His name is Jim Brown. He's a longtime AOI supporter. He's a great guy. He's a good friend. He's going to do a fantastic job. Uh, I'm not going away. I will be doing more of this stuff, more yelling at you over the radio and by Facebook Live and all kinds of other fun stuff. So I need to figure out at this point what I'm going to be doing with the rest of my life. But um, I, I can guarantee you that it's not that I'm going to go away. Uh, but I'm excited. We've got a division of labor going on. We've got a CEO for the Ayn Rand Institute. I'm going to be executive chairman and, and president uh, starting on Monday. And, um, yeah, I'm all you on the radio. That's definitely what you're going to get. You're going to get more you on publicly, generally. And what you guys need to do is join me in the fight. And uh, you can still do that by making a contribution to the Ayn Rand Institute, by live tweeting these shows by liking and sharing all this stuff on Facebook and everywhere else. by You know, I've been told, the standard is this. 10,000 downloads a day of the podcast. 10,000 downloads a day. So if I don't count Facebook Live, because I don't know how to measure, if Facebook Live distorts everything, but if I don't count Facebook Live, we're at about 2,000 a day today. So we need a 5X downloads of the Iran Brook Show from now until the end of 2017. I'm pumped up to get that done. So you guys need to join me in getting pumped up and get that done. All right? And if we do that, we can change the world. One mind at a time. All right. Have a great New Year. Have a great party or whatever you do tonight. Um, live it up. And uh, to a uh, incredibly successful 2017 A year of reason. How about a year of rediscovering the human mind? All right. You'll be listening to the Iran Brooks Show, and I will talk to you next week, same time, same place.